This this year it'll be 75 years since D-Day happened. And I was wondering, do those are those memories still vivid? I just wonder how many people living that uh, went in D-Day. I know, I know there's probably not very many. You're, you're probably one of the few left. See, there's my company. Yeah? It's hard to believe. There's 200 of us. And at one point, we only had 60 left. Was wounded, killed, or what? But then they, they chose how come how you you know Saint Lowe. Mm -hmm. They chose us to break the line of a night. And it's supposed to be other people come in the gap, spread it out. Now the soul showed up. Just you guys. We was cut off in our two days and nights. And we lost some men. Well, I don't know how many was left. The border section was wiped out. Which section? Mortar. Mortar. Mortar section. Yeah. And I had the machine gun section. I was in combat constant for 82 days. Yeah. In other words, I was one of the first 30 that landed. Mm hmm And the... The coxswain of our boat, LCBP, just carried 30. And we were loading off the ship. We was supposed to, in them LCBP, rendezvous out there and all together go in. Mm -hmm. But when his boat got loaded, he took off and landed. And we was the only ones there. And uh, all hell broke loose when the rest of them came in. We was inside and land when these people come in. Oh, okay. That didn't do too much to us, just 30 of us, rifle fire, about the whole thing we had. Yeah. And when the rest of them come in, that's what was taking place. Tell me how you got your silver star. Uh, at St. Lowe, they wiped the when we was cut off, they wiped the mortar section out. And uh, they was trying to get the, the guns and ammunition, and I kept them off of it. Oh, your, were they trying to get your guns or their guns? The it was cannon. our guns. Oh, okay. Mortars. Oh, oh, I see. Well, and that's pillbox, uh -huh. fourteen inches steel. I was about a hundred yards in front of one of them. Not that one, but and uh, it's in the night. 
I dug me a slit trench to lay down in below the top of the ground. A piece of shrapnel come out of the sky. And I say it's off our artillery shooting at that. And it tore a hunk of meat out of my buttocks. As that bricks branch. Uh-huh. Uh, they uh they had them around to protect the submarine pens. Mm -hmm. And the submarine pens are all underground. There's a congressional medal of honor. There's two of them on one in my company. Mm. What was his name? Paragor, Sergeant Paragor. Paragor? Commander. He was killed there at St. Louis. He come in with us and they surround us. There wasn't no where for us to go. Tom How Howie? Yeah. Yeah. He just played his body in uh, St. Lowe. There's a hedgerow. I was back over a year or so ago. Wasn't well, none of them left. That was the 60th anniversary we went to France. Talk a little bit about how you feel about being a hundred years old. Oh. Just talk a little bit and tell him what you think about, not, not the nation, <laughs> but just personally what you think about. Well, I don't hold enough to think about it. And the whole thing of, it worries me. I can't travel, I can't do nothing. Mm -hmm. And I don't worry about it too much. Well, not very many people live to be 100 though. So does that feel like an accomplishment to do that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, Dad, did growing up rough the way you did, do you think that helped you survive the war? I don't know. I said, I, I give the man above credit for pulling me through. Because I had Bullet black put my eye one time. It hit the top of the head rose, spin itself, bounced out, hit me in the eye. Then I had a, a bullet to burn my neck and jaw from a sniper. That's close. And uh, I had my machine gun section. They had a big hole there was in it. And I was out of help gathering the wounded up. And I went back to check on them. I had my foot up on top of the pile of dirt. And they said, you better get down because it's sniper far up there. And I turned my head and it... Wow. Close. I went in to get them first if I could before they got me. Yeah, yeah. 
And that's the way I worked. When you all were cut off, tell him what you tried to do that the sort that your commanding officer pulled you back. Tanks moved in on us. It's a tiger tank had its gun over stick it over the head row. And our ammunition was staggered with armor pierce. And I took a clip, put all armor pierce, same far down the barrel of that gun, if they had it loaded, might put it off in the gun. And uh, his first sergeant was company commander. Got down to that. And he grabbed me by the precious, throwed me over the hedgerow, said, what are you doing, trying to do, get killed? I said, well, I hadn't thought, thought of that. <laughs> It was a rough time in that pillbox there. Of course, I, I'm, I'm a thinking, because there was nothing, no activity at the time. The shrapnel from shells is farted into the pillbox. And they tore a good swath out of it. Well, I, I spent about two months in the hospital, and they said that uh, they were going to have start leaving open to start healing in the bottom. And uh, I spent about two months there, and they sewed it up one day, took stitches out the next day and shipped me out. Hmm. And I guess that sort of saved me. See, I was doing the bows and shipping me. Well, I. They shipped you, did they ship you out before the bulge hit? You I went, shipped me back to France. And they had what they called 10th Replacement Command in England. A bunch of doctors checking the wounded that had been wounded as going back. And uh, this doctor that I went to, he was white-headed, old fellow. And he, he said to me, he said, what do you think about it, soldier? I said, I'm in the damn army. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> he said, drop your pants, soldier. And drop my pants, he said, oh. He marked me lemon aside. I went plumb back to Belgium and then back into France. Mm. Spent the rest of the winter squad tenant in the woods. <laughs> that, that wasn't a pleasant thing. <laughs> it's cold. Yeah. You were off but the that old man, he's the one that saved me. Mm -hmm. I went, uh, they shipped me back to, up to Belgium. And the officer there, he got my paperwork, I reckon. He called me over to his office. He said, who in the hell? Hell sent you up here. 
I said, I don't know who set me up. <laughs> well, he said, you get your, go back over and get your stuff together. Come back over here. Truck comes up out of here. Said, you get on it. So they hauled me back in the front. Mm. I spent, like I said, rest of the winter in the woods. Was it the Copian Forest? Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna put you in the middle of the floor. How will it be? Huh? <laughs> you're the you're the guest of honor. <laughs> uh, I'm Dennis Elkins. Huh? I'm Dennis Elkins. Um, I'm a Vietnam veteran, but I'm the uh, vice commander at our American Legion post. Okay, uh, this is the Quilts of Valor Foundation um, that is presenting this quilt to you. And it says, uh, Quilts of Valor Foundation is a grassroots group of volunteer out quilters from across the U.S., founded in 2004. It says, our mission is to honor our service members and veterans who have been touched by war with Quilts of Valor. It is my honor and privilege to award Mr. Hubert Lee McConnell with his personal quilt of valor on behalf of the Quilts of Valor Foundation. Each quilt brings a three-part message from our hearts. First, we honor you for your military service in the U.S. Army, World War II, 29th Division, 116th Infantry Company C. K. Or Company K, yes, Company K. We honor you for leaving all you hold dear and to stand in harm's way in a time of crisis, protecting us from the effects of war. Yeah. But we believe these quilts of valor have the ability to offer both comfort and warmth. We hope when you experience dark times or need the warmth of a grateful hug, you will wrap your quilt around yourself so it can provide the comfort we have sewn into every seam. Each quilt of valor is presented with a hug. The hug comes not only from me, but also from every member of the Quilts of Valor family and the Happy Hearts Quilt Guild. We do. Yes, we do. It's a good birthday present, ain't it? Yeah. This is from one veteran to another. Oh, yeah. And uh, I want to present you this hat. And uh, it's got your... Uh, it's got World War II veteran. It's got a, the infantry uh, symbol on it. It's combat also combat badge. Combat badge. It's also got your uh, division. Division and let and tell me what that duck means on there. Yeah. What does the duck mean? The duck represents something. What does the duck represent for your group? I don't know. Well, the only thing, but there's a lapel pin for me. And also, here is a souvenir coffee mug from the United States Army. <laughs> That's good. Man, you, you're racking up, ain't you? And there's an Army pin. It's got the U.S. Army on it. So. Yeah, I'll use that. All right. Is it, it's worth, almost worth living 100 years just to get all this stuff, ain't it? <laughs> <laughs> And what I was doing my research, and I, uh, I came up with this story on his unit. Oh. This is for you, Mr. Bobo. Okay. Uh, I went ahead and copied two copies. It tells about the uh, uh, 29th and 116th Infantry Division, and also there's an article or two in here with, from your company, Company K. Yeah. So I'll, I'll leave this with you. I try to do a little research when I do something. So he got a silver star. Yeah, he has a silver star. It's right here. Um, well, the, uh, he got the um, purple heart. Oh my goodness. Oh. That's awesome. That picture was taken in England. Okay. okay, and they had to mark their division 
out before they could send the pictures home. Oh, cool. Is that they right? Did, yeah. They said that home had to take a vision signal. Right. Now, some of the, the well, uniforms one. that I seen on their lapel, when I brought it up on the internet, it actually had that duck yeah. on there. Wow, so I don't know. I don't mm. know when it came about. 